All right, everybody, welcome to the Rowan College of Burlington County Global Studies Lecture Series. This is a continuation of a series of conversations that started in fall 2020 in global health, environment, and security, and key international issues affecting those. This is partially sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education's Undergraduate uh, International Studies and Foreign Language Grant Program, a multi-year grant uh, that Rowan College has with our partner institution, Rowan University, to build global and international studies uh, designations and courses, uh, and uh, not only in global studies, but also in high demand languages, along with student activities reflecting these initiatives. This event, of course, is also hosted by Rowan College, a mid-sized two and three-year college in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, serving the geographic geographically largest county in the state, with anywhere from seven to 9,000 students each semester. Uh, RCBC has one of the most ethnically diverse student bodies in the state and the wider mid-Atlantic region, uh, with one of the lowest tuition costs as well. I'm your host, for this event in this series, I'm Brandon Chapman, Instructor and Department Chair of Anthropology and Sociology at the College. It's nice to see all of you again. The goal of the lecture series is to bring to our college campus and here our virtual WebEx campus, top level scholars, academics, researchers, and industry professionals at all levels of career, early, mid, and late career, that are experienced, knowledgeable scholars in global health, environment, and security issues, and to develop this knowledge and skill in our students at both Rowan University and Rowan College and to have a dynamic conversation about key global issues within these areas and to give our students such avenues to advance their training in these areas, of course, as well. Look for uh, more of these events in the future. We will have uh, likely one or two of these uh, this coming summer, and uh, that schedule will be coming out soon, but this is the last uh, one of these for our spring semester here. We've had a few before this. And so this evening, uh, this Wednesday evening, we have the pleasure of welcoming, once again, uh, for a second time, Dr. Hal Brands, Henry A. Kissinger, Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs at John Hopkins, uh, the John Hopkins University School of Inter uh, Advanced International Studies and a Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Dr. Brands is a leading and recognized global scholar in the history of U.S. grand strategies in foreign policy and international relations in the history of the Cold War and U.S. defense strategies. He has numerous and current past affiliations, uh, research and writing about these issues with various think tanks and universities, uh, such as the Brookings Institution, the Foreign Policy Research Institute, Georgetown University, and Duke University besides his two current affiliations. Beyond his academic publication, he also writes regularly in key news and analysis outlets such as Foreign Affairs and Bloomberg Opinion. And he has served uh, at some of the highest levels of our federal government, including being Special Assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Strategic Planning, as a lead writer for the National Defense uh, Strategy Commission, and he's also worked under Secretary uh, of, of Defense Ash Carter at the Department of Defense. A note on format and the agenda for the event. Uh, this one we will be having, uh, I'll be having a discussion uh, with Hal uh, about our topic. And uh, as we go along, I do note uh, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see what looks like a little uh, uh, talking cloud, uh, which is your chat function in WebEx. Uh, if you want to press that, it will bring up the chat board and you're able to type in your uh, questions. Uh, that I can get to Hal, and also if you want to have uh, uh, a chance to ask him on audio, you can also raise your hand and I can get you uh, that capability as well as we go along. So with that, uh, and with uh, our talk here uh, titled After uh, Hal and His Colleague's Book, Danger Zone, The Coming Conflict with China, uh, let's welcome uh, Hal Brands to Rowan College once again. So Hal, thank you for joining us on this Wednesday evening. Thank, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. I enjoyed this last time, so I am looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. And I apologize uh, to start with. I, you have a co-author on this book, this uh, recent publication, Michael Beckley, who's an associate professor of political science, I believe, at Tufts University. I apologize, couldn't have him here this evening, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, speak well for your uh, publication. I know he taught, he is uh, published and talked a lot about uh, the history of, of the United States as a superpower. Uh, but uh, um, but I, I know you'll be able to represent the book well, of course. So yeah. Mike, Mike is a dynamite scholar, a, a good friend. Uh, the parts of the book that you don't like are the ones that he wrote. The parts that you do like are the ones that, that I wrote. And I'll be sure to convey any criticism to him personally after the event. All right, we'll throw all the criticism, if any, on Mike then. So, all right, <laughs> sounds good. Um, speaking of superpower status, maybe we can start uh, with that. So that maybe leads into a uh, first question here. So. As I understand it, part of your main argument is that the the factors that led to the relatively rapid rise of China 
uh, especially economically through the 90s, 2000s, perhaps even into the early 2010s, that some of those factors are currently or will soon become constraints, uh, especially when it comes to comparing them to us as a potential rival or maybe even superseding global superpower. Um, I think you at uh, various points talk about this as a kind of peaking of China, so to speak. So could you start off maybe if this is an appropriate place to begin, you know, talking about that argument um, and maybe going along with that after that, some of these factors, some of the evidence for these factors that are uh, maybe constraining China now and into the future as far as their rivalry for uh, with us essentially as the main global power. Absolutely. So I, I think maybe the best way of summarizing our argument is that it's meant to be a counterintuitive addition to the let's all hyperventilate about China uh, school of thought. And Mike and I, uh, in our book, we, we argue that China does indeed present a threat to the United States and to its allies, and that threat may manifest in military terms sooner than many of us realize, perhaps in the latter part of the current decade. But it's not because, as you know, you've often been told, China is about to overtake the United States as the world's great superpower economically and, and militarily. It's actually because of the opposite. And so, so the, sort of the thesis is that China is more dangerous than you may think because it has more problems than you may think. And in particular, it's got problems that are going to prevent it from achieving its very lofty ambitions peacefully. Now, to be to be clear about what we're saying, China's rise is real. The economic rise has been spectacular uh, over the past 45 years, going back to the beginning of the reform and opening period under Deng Xiaoping in uh, 1978. The military rise has been breathtaking. China has about a three decade military buildup that's been underway that has profoundly changed the balance of power in the Western Pacific and potentially beyond. But the reason we argue that China is a peaking power is that um, many of the things that drove this accretion of power over the past 40 years, these factors have now dried up or even gone into reverse. And so just to look at the economic dimension of the problem for a moment, because economic power ultimately underlies military power and, and global power, the Chinese economic miracle didn't just happen. It, it took a confluence of five key factors for China to grow at these breathtaking rates from the late 1970s through the late 2000s and then at a lesser rate uh, since then. The first was uh, demography. And so China had a, a population that was primed for prosperity because it had lots of working age individuals with relatively few little kids or elderly parents to take care of. That's great from an economic perspective. China had lots of the resources it needed. It was largely self-sufficient in food, energy, uh, and other things that were needed to, to drive economic growth. Uh, China had a good economic context in the sense that the leaders that came after Mao Zedong moved away from autarky and the command economy that had prevailed under Mao and had led to disasters like the Great Leap Forward with a more open, outward-facing, and frankly, capitalistic economy than you might expect under a regime led by the Chinese Communist Party. The fourth factor was that the political context was relatively uh, conducive to growth as well. China has always been, under the People's Republic, a fairly thuggish autocratic state, um, but you had a more responsive, more technocratic version of authoritarianism emerge under Deng and his successors, which created greater scope for economic growth. And then the final factor, and in some ways the most important, was China had a welcoming world in the sense that the most important economies in the world, the most important uh, democracies in the world, including the United States, were rooting for China to become richer, more powerful, more influential. First, because they saw it as an ally against the Soviet Union during the late Cold War. And after that, because they hoped that by drawing China into the international system, they could reconcile China to that international system and make it a responsible stakeholder in the system. 
And so uh, the United States and many of its allies helped uh, China avail itself of the trade, of the technology, of the know-how that drove its growth or that helped drive its growth over a number of years. And when you put all these things together, you get the remarkable economic performance uh, that we saw from China after reform and opening began. The problem is that all of these factors have now gone into reverse. And so China is approaching a demographic implosion. Uh, it's going to lose large numbers of working age individuals over the coming decades and gain lots and lots and lots of senior citizens. That's a formula that's very bad for growth uh, historically. It's running out of resources. It's become highly dependent on imports of everything from meat to uh, energy. It is running out of arable land and usable water to power its growth. The political context is going in the wrong direction. We've seen a more neo-totalitarian system emerge under Xi Jinping in which he has increasingly intruded on the workings of the economy by placing his loyalists in leadership cells at top companies, for instance, because he's trying to centralize political control at the expense of economic growth. As a result of that, the fourth factor, the economic reform program has stalled or even gone into reverse over the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, you see a regime that is increasingly prioritizing political stability and ideological mobilization over the sort of go-go growth that was prioritized for, for about three decades after the beginning of reform and opening. And China no longer faces a welcoming world. Uh, per international perceptions of China, particularly in the advanced democracies, so North America, uh, East Asia, Europe, have, have fallen off a cliff over the past three years, largely due to COVID and other factors. Um, advanced democracies are walling off sectors of their economies uh, to Chinese influence. If you look at the way that countries around the world have imposed restrictions on the role that Huawei or ZTE might play in their 5G telecommunications networks, to give one example, they're even trying to uh, attrit and undermine the sources of Chinese integration and, and growth. This is very much the intent of the sanctions that the United States applied um, to the Chinese semiconductor industry last fall and then got Japan and the Netherlands uh, to come along with applying those sanctions as well. So when you add all of that up, the result is that China's days of easiest and most explosive growth are behind it. Uh, China is not going to grow at anything like the rates of, say, the early 2000s in the coming years. It's not going to grow at the rates of the 2010s in the coming years. It's, it's looking at a future of economic stagnation. We, we can talk more about sort of why that makes China more, more dangerous. But that's the core of the argument in terms of why China is, is not going to overtake the United States economically anytime soon. As you said, I imagine we'll get more into many of these factors as we go along here in the next hour or so. So, the, you know, we can see this evidence from our side of the ocean, I suppose, in some ways. These are big things, demography, economy, integration, and, you know, resistance to uh, a reordering or expansionist or revisionist power sort of thing in the in the in the sense of trying to remake the global liberal order that sort of stuff but let me ask you i mean how do we have evidence of how china sees this um we can say this from our sort of analytical perspective from our side but is there evidence or um do you draw on this in the book you know how how does how do the one party state officials in china actually perceive the you know multiple or all of these factors do they see themselves as peaking as you are and you are as you and michael are arguing or some in somewhat a similar fashion um how can we say what can we say about the evidence for that and how they see themselves essentially do they see the same thing or something something different yeah great great question so so first off let me kind of acknowledge the methodological difficulty here which is that the, the Chinese Communist Party has always been relatively opaque and very secretive, and that problem has gotten much, much worse under Xi Jinping. And so there's simply not available the same transparency that would allow one to get at, say, like, what does the Biden administration really think about X, right? It's, it's even if Xi Jinping um, fully subscribed to our thesis, moreover, he would have reasons not to admit that publicly because it would be bad for him politically. That said, I think that when you when you ask the question of you know how do how does China uh, view its own position, it is with uh, ambivalence bordering on schizophrenia. And so, 
you can find lots of expressions of Chinese confidence about China's position. Xi Jinping will say the East is rising and the West is declining. Um, Chinese intellectuals will talk about how the balance of power has shifted in fundamental ways. But across each of the dimensions that I just talked about, you really don't have to look very hard to find examples of Chinese officials who are manifesting obvious concern with exactly the issues that we've pointed to. And I'll give you a, a recent example of this. And so uh, about a month ago, I believe it was on March 6th, Xi Jinping gave a major address in which he said that the United States and its allies were pursuing now a campaign of suppression and containment uh, against China. And this was posing unprecedented difficulties for China's development. You can find um, you know, lots of commentators within kind of the, PL, the uh, PRC ecosystem who are commenting on the fact that, that China seems to be alienating a lot of countries at the same time. Going back about 10 to 15 years, um, Chinese leaders, including um, premiers of China, so basically the, the number, two number two government official in the system who's more or less responsible for management, of the economy have, have said that the, the economy is unbalanced and unsustainable. Um, you can find clear indications of concern with the demographic uh, picture. And sometimes you can find these indications of concern not in what is said, but what is in not allowed, what is not allowed to be said. And, and so China has severely cracked down on the reporting of bad economic news uh, in recent years and bad demographic news as well. And so there was this remarkable episode uh, about two years ago where I believe it was the Financial Times ran a story to the effect that China's population had declined uh, for the first time since the 1960s, uh, I believe. And the basically the National Statistics Bureau issued a one sentence rebuttal that says the population continues to grow. And, and so you, you clearly get a sense that there is at the same, you know, at once great confidence about the strengths that China has already developed, uh, mixed with real concern about the trajectory of the country on a variety of different levels. There's, there are some substantial communications there is what you're saying internally within the Communist Party and with the officials that there are, that there is recognition here that there are these these problems now on the horizon so so this this is this is this is really good i mean good in the sense that we do have we do we do have it seems uh a good amount of data that even with the you know the the opaque nature of this as as you said there, there's enough there to to show that they are they are certainly think not only thinking about it but integrating it into their 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 views and into maybe even some of how they operate and and those sorts of things so that's 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 certainly uh, cer cer certainly pertinent here. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the more uh, more of the resistance, and these, I think the last two answers you talked about, some of the um, resistance to uh, China, uh, both from the U.S. and also globally. Um, maybe we could talk about that a little bit. What, um, this has turned, you know, in the recent years, uh, certainly in the United States now, we seem to have more of a uh, I could say both, you know, both in the public and also just politically uh, at the national level, certainly bipartisan sort of more of a consensus about China being, um, you know, uh, not necessarily shouldn't use the term enemy, but something uh, as close as we can, uh, we can, we can define to that. Um, how committed and sustainable is this resistance to China as an expansionist and revisionist power in the world? Um, perhaps that's something we could speak to either from I don't know how you want to take this either from the U.S. or even more globally from within the region of uh, the, the neighbors of China. I suppose there are a lot of ways to go with this. Do we see a lot of consistent resistance to the idea of China expanding, of China as revisionist, and um, and and sort of how important is that of these factors that we talked about? So there's a few different ways to slice this. Maybe the first point to make is that Pretty much everywhere you look within, let's call it the advanced democratic world, views of China are more negative than they were, say, five years ago. And what you might term resistance to Chinese power is, is greater. So that, that's true, certainly in the United States, where, as you noted, there's now a bipartisan consensus that China is 
geopolitical enemy number one, even as the United States is also dealing with Russian aggression uh, in UK, Ukraine and a variety of other problems. It's true um, up and down the Western Pacific. Uh, and so you can see this in Japan, for instance, where views of China have turned starkly negative and Japan has now undertaken the lar its largest military buildup since, frankly, the 1930s uh, as a way of trying to strengthen its capabilities so it can defend itself not simply against North Korea, but also against China. You can see it in the Philippines, which has moved back towards a closer relationship with the United States um, since Bong Bong Marcos took over from Rodrigo Duterte uh, about a year ago. You can see it in Australia with the AUKUS uh, partnership involving the United Kingdom and the United States and, and so on and so forth. And you can see it even farther afield. You can see it in Europe, for instance. And so uh, if you look at the way that key European countries, the UK, France, Germany, for instance, are participating in military exercises in the Western Pacific, which are clearly aimed at China. If you look at the ways in which uh, EU leaders are talking about um, not decoupling, but de-risking, basically making their economies less dependent on uh, trade with China, there, there's clearly concern almost everywhere at what a more assertive China may do. And so there's more willingness to push back, whether that's you know bilaterally in the US-Japan alliance, for instance, many laterally in the Quad or through AUKUS or multilaterally through say G7 or something like that. But it's not an unmixed um, picture because the reality is that every country that is concerned about Chinese power is also deeply, deeply interdependent with the Chinese economy. And so both for better and for worse, that creates a break. It creates friction that gets in the way of measures that might the countries might take to make themselves say more militarily or technologically competitive with, with China. And even in the United States, um, you've seen moves towards partial technological decoupling with China involving semiconductor supply chains to give one example. But the overall volume of US-China trade has gone up uh, in recent years. There are many European countries, European firms that are still very dependent on the Chinese market for their future growth. Um, China is the number one trade partner of, I believe, every US treaty ally and major security partner in the Western Pacific. And, and so what you're seeing is uh, what political scientists would call balancing countries are pushing back against a threat but it's ambivalent balancing because they don't want to fully sever their relationships with china and they're conscious that if relations with china get really bad they'll take a significant economic hit so this is not like the cold war where you had a western coalition that and this is something of an exaggeration but it gets at the heart of the matter had you know relatively few economic ties with the Soviet Union, had relatively little to lose other obviously than the danger of war in terms of a containment policy. That, that's just not the case today. So are, are we, do you think we're making any, mis any major mistakes right now or recently in our dealings with China? I mean, um, should, for example, should we be trying to make more, I mean, we already do through USAID and these other entities, uh, try to make more um, more inroads into places where China has uh, um, uh, has made their mark, sort of, and, you know, especially parts of the global south, uh, you know, uh, whatever term you want to use, uh, lesser economically developed nations. Um, you know, maybe we could get into some of the strategies here and, uh, and do you think there are any major mistakes going on as far as you, know, we talked, you just mentioned the, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the sort of tougher stance on China in a way from the U S uh, in terms of trade, but yet the trade volume is still quite high. Um, what, what do we think about this as far as what we're doing currently? Um, any advice on this, I suppose. So I'll start by saying that I think the overall trend, the direction of U.S. policy is is mostly correct, is mostly right, is mostly constructive over the past three or four years. I think the move toward a more competitive stance vis-a-vis -vis China was overdue. I, I think it was necessary. And I can point to lots of initiatives 
that both the Trump and the Biden administration have undertaken to strengthen the position of the United States. And so just to give you one example, both administrations invested in the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. It's this group comprising the US, Australia, Japan, and India, four democracies, all uh, located in the Indo-Pacific region in some way or another, all of which are threatened by China's rise and are doing more together technologically, militarily, and in other realms to, to try to hold the balance uh, where it is today. So I could give lots of examples, but in general, I, I think that the trajectory has been fairly good. But I do think you, you can absolutely identify, let's call it, you know, mistakes of omission and mistakes of commission uh, as well. And so on, on the omission side, I think there are areas where the United States is still really struggling. So the United States is clearly struggling to come up with a regional trade agenda that will be attractive to countries in the Asia Pacific and Southeast Asia in particular, and help give them alternatives to deep, deep reliance on the Chinese market. We had a strategy for this a number of years ago. It was called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a trade agreement that the United States led the way in negotiating before the entire U.S. political system, you know, leaders of both parties turned against it and ultimately withdrew from that under President Trump. The, the good news is that the agreement survived just without the United States, Australia and uh, Japan in particular played a key role in keeping it alive. But basically what you see is the U.S. is, is absent from one very important part of shaping the economic agenda in the region, and that's to our detriment in competition with China. There are what you might call mistakes or issues of omission on the military side uh, as well. And so one of the arguments that Mike and I make in our book is that while the United States and other countries have relatively smart plans for trying to shore up the Western Pacific against Chinese intimidation or Chinese aggression, we're just not going nearly fast enough in implementing them. And so there's some recent reporting um, from think tanks in Washington to the effect that the United States would run out of munitions uh, in a conflict with China within a few days and would have no way of producing more at an expedited rate because the defense industrial base just isn't suited for that sort of surge effort uh, in the way that it might have been during World War II or the Cold War. There, there have been some efforts, there are some efforts underway to address that, but you know, we're sort of tweaking at the margin as opposed to acting with the urgency that the moment requires. So those might be two two errors we're making or two two areas where US policy is not optimal by any means, but it also goes the other way. And so there are mistakes of commission as well as omission. And you know, I, I think that the to kind of frame this broadly, the problem the United States has is that it has become very politically convenient to be very tough on China rhetorically, but you know, being tough on China rhetorically may not always be the thing that's smartest in terms of, of strengthening your position in the competition. And so I am I'm wholly in favor of efforts that would help Taiwan defend itself by, by selling Taiwan more of the arms it needs, by pushing Taiwan hard to, adopt, to embrace the uh, defense concept that it has formally adopted and, and so on and so forth. I'm less uh, enthusiastic about, you know, Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan in August 2022 and thereby touching off the biggest military crisis in the Strait in 25 years. To be to be clear, I think that you know, crisis responsibility for it you know, ultimately lies to a significant degree with China, which chose to respond to the visit in a certain way. But what we need is kind of more smart provocation. It's okay to do things that annoy China if they really strengthen your position and less of kind of the showy symbolic provocation that doesn't actually make us or our allies any safer. More substantial things, like you said, uh, you know, deepening trade ties with uh, our allies in the region, um, you know, and, and less of the bombastic symbolic uh, items, as you said, it's 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 a it's a, it's a very it's it's a very interesting summary. Um, I'm wondering if, and we should also say too, uh, maybe a little more controversial, but the long longer term military long term military strategy shouldn't be controversial. Long term military buildup, you know, that's a little more controversial, certainly. Uh, but those are all really important points. So, is there something to learn then, or are there things to learn from 
historical lessons about how to deal with a a peaking power like this as so goes your argument i think um you know obviously we've seen peaking powers in the past through history um i know you and your historical background would probably give a lot of different examples uh, maybe we could focus on you know, one or two of what you think are most pertinent or mo most relevant i should say um but uh, are there do we see in history any effective strategies to try and deter such again and, and we should define our terms here and a, a power perceiving China today as a potentially expansionist power meaning the potential to take Taiwan and things that it sees under its historical civilizational purview and revisionist power in the sense that it's a power that seems to want to possibly remake the global liberal order so to speak given some history history lessons from that are there are there some strategies we can see about how to uh, deter such peaking powers anywhere in recent or some history? I think there are. The first thing I should say, though, is that a lot of the examples that history provides are actually cause for pessimism rather than, than optimism. And so if, if you think about uh, some of the most destructive wars of the modern era, they were started at least in part by countries that fit this profile, um, countries that have been rising for a long time, started to plateau economically and strategically vis-a-vis -vis their competitors, kind of freaked out about it, and then became much more risk acceptant. The the best example, I think, the closest parallel is, is Germany prior to World War One. You know, Germany had been this economic dynamo, uh, this military juggernaut for about four decades after unification in the early 1870s. It, it le looked to be on a path to dominate Europe and, and spread its power beyond. It had articulated these very big ambitions of uh, middle middle Europe, basically creating, creating a vast sphere of influence between kind of the North Sea and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, achieving power on a global scale. But in doing so, Germany provoked the hostility of this ring of competitors, the, the Triple Entente of the UK, Russia, and France that began to take discriminatory economic measures against Germany, that began to increase the size of their own militaries, that began to work more closely together. And so the problem was that German leaders believed they had a closing window of opportunity to achieve the goals they had laid out. And so if, if we're wondering kind of historically, why does Germany behave so recklessly in the 1914 crisis that followed the assassination of Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo? Why does it seem like it's almost looking for a fight for the first month of that crisis? Well, it's precisely because this now or never mentality had taken hold in Berlin. There are other historical examples of this as well, but I think that's in many ways the most sobering one because we all know what happened uh, next. Now, there are uh, examples that lend themselves perhaps to greater optimism. And so one that we spend some time talking about uh, in our book is, is the example of the Soviet Union during the early uh, Cold War and also during the late Cold War. And, and so the Soviet Union in certain ways doesn't technically fit our definition. We have kind of a te technical definition of peaking power in the book, a country that was growing by at least X percent over a certain period of time and then slowed down. But the Soviet Union did have some distinct windows of opportunity during the early Cold War. It had sort of a window of political and economic opportunity in the late 1940s when Western Europe in particular was in economic chaos, had a window of military opportunity because the United States had demobilized so quickly after World War II. And so it had a dominant position within kind of the key regions of Eurasia. And there are some lessons that emerge from that because that's obviously a case in which a major war doesn't break out between uh, the great powers and ultimately the United States and its allies create this stable world order, then they, they win the Cold War. And so maybe a, a couple of the lessons would be, you know, the first is that you have to be creative and you have to be uh, flexible and you got to be willing to move fast in solving big problems. And so what's remarkable is that a lot of the initiatives that the United States and its allies undertook during the old, early Cold War were not the the subject of, you know, intensive months and months of planning beforehand, 
they were kind of like hammered together over a weekend or over a couple of weeks in a couple of key cases. And so the, the Truman Doctrine, which involves providing aid to Greece and Turkey when they are facing pressure from either their own internal communists or the Soviet Union, that was formulated over a single weekend after the British embassy kind of dropped a bomb on the United States by saying, we can't support these guys anymore. The, the Marshall Plan took, took form over about three weeks uh, in May and early June 1947. There, there was a, really, a real willingness to kind of think outside the box in terms of quickly putting together innovative solutions to policy uh, problems. There was a willingness to go rapidly in trying to close off areas of vulnerability, whether that was the economic vulnerability that was softening up Western Europe for communist gains in the 1940s, or the military vulnerability that was revealed during the Korean War, which the United States tries to close off through this monumental military buildup from 1950 to 1953. And so one of the lessons is just kind of like be willing to go fast and break things. But a competing lesson or a complementary lesson actually is that you got to be really careful about not escalating the competition unnecessarily because the problem with countries that have closing windows of opportunity is they're very jumpy right they're, they're in some cases they're looking for a reason to go to war and so the united states had to be very careful about doing things that might unintentionally escalate the cold war and so one example of this was rearming West Germany, right? And so, so Germany defeated power after World War II, the Soviets take the East, the US and its allies occupy the West, and then the United States and its allies start reviving Western Germany, creating the, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany in 1949. And then once the Korean War breaks out, they take the decision that the only way to defend Western Europe is to mobilize German economic and military power in the service of that objective. Now, of course, this was intensely controversial in the West, but it was also infuriating to the Soviets because, of course, West Germany was one of the successor states to the Third Reich, which had invaded the Soviet Union uh, in 1941. And so U.S. intelligence analysts said quite explicitly that kind of the full-scale rearmament of West Germany could be so provocative that it would lead the Soviets to, to undertake a war against the West rather than see it happen. And so the Truman administration kind of decided two things. First, it said, well, look, yeah, we understand this is a risk, but it's a risk that we have to take because the risk of, of military weakness vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union is, is greater, right? And that was a judgment that you could argue about, but it was the judgment that they made. But the second decision they made was that they were going to rearm West Germany in a way meant to be um, as non-provocative as possible. And so the short, short way of describing this is that West Germany was rearmed and integrated into NATO in a way that made it almost impossible for West Germany to use force in a major way on its own because it was reliant on certain capabilities that its allies, the United States in particular, could provide. and because it was very clearly understood within the Western Alliance that the Germans were not going to be encouraged or perhaps even allowed to get their hands on, to get sole possession of, of nuclear weapons. And, and so the United States undertook, made certain concessions to Soviet sensitivities to avoid unwanted escalation. And so you might ask, well, okay, what's, what's the parallel today, right? And, and the parallel today, I think, is that we need to make clear, as clear as we can, that what the United States is doing by increasing military support to Taiwan, for instance, or um, planning uh, more intensively for a potential conflict in the Western Pacific, is not by any means meant to enable Taiwan to, say, declare independence from China, which is a line that, if crossed, almost certainly would provoke a Chinese attack. The goal is simply to maintain the status quo that has, I don't know that it served both sides well, but it's been tolerable to both sides uh, over the past uh, 70 plus years, and that the United States would oppose any moves by Taiwan to escalate the situation by declaring independence or moving toward independence. That That's the sort of kind of unsatisfying policy that's probably necessary to, so that you're blending 
deterrence and strength on the one hand with kind of reasonable reassurance of the other side and the other. I'm not sure it'll work, but at least it's the sort of policy that we ought to be pursuing. It's it's a realistic view and um, the uh, the Russian and global historian, I think Stephen Cockin once said, you know, uh, better to have a cold war than a hot war, right? Um, I mean, if we're going to call what we're in and have been in for a while a cold war, this sort of resistance turn towards China, um, obviously better that. And, and as you said, going to your status quo point, I mean, the status quo is obviously better now than some sort of, you know, uh, conflict, of course. So, and, you know, the answer that you just gave really flowed, I think, well from the previous answer to about, you know, uh, a, a power that sees itself maybe in the future, at, at now or in the future at, at hitting this peak, you don't want to provoke necessarily, because that's when historically we can see this can be really, really dangerous. So, um, if we could sort of extend that sort of topic, then I mean, I, I you know, is there, is there any sort of how China and the U.S. sort of look at the timeline for this? I don't know if there's any way to specify that a little bit about, you know, again, the argument here is that China is peaking. Well, do they do they or we as we see them see any sort of window for when if 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 a bad scenario were to happen, are they looking at certain time frames when they think? that would be or when a window would close for that to happen. I don't know if that's too specific of a question, uh, but uh, but but what do we have any indicators about, uh, you know, either from our intelligence standpoint or from the, the China's uh, regime standpoint, are they looking at some sort of timeline realistically about when their window is going to close for some sort of thing with Taiwan for some sort of, a, you know, so th th these sorts of things they can do before they, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, you know at, at or after their peak? So uh, one point I should offer here is that you sometimes get the impression from reading the newspaper or hearing people talk that Xi Jinping has made a decision that he's going to invade Taiwan on or by X date, 2025, 2027, 2035, take your pick. That's almost certainly not true. Um, everything we know indicates that you know, Xi Jinping has not made a decision to do that sort of thing. But there are a number of you know, metaphorical clocks that are ticking. And what makes it complicated is that you know, there are at least three or four of those clocks. And so the, the first clock, let's call it the Xi Jinping clock. And, and this clock is running because Xi Jinping has basically said that you know, while China has waited from its perspective a long, long time for Taiwan to come back into the embrace of the mainland, uh, it can't wait forever, and that the the task of achieving unification should not be passed down from generation to generation. There are different ways of reading this statement, but the way a lot of China watchers read it is that it should not be passed down to the next generation of Chinese leaders. In other words, it should happen on Xi Jinping's watch. Again, that doesn't mean that he's decided to invade, right? It simply means that there is a degree of urgency that is associated with his personal legacy. And so that's clock one. Clock two, uh, and by the way, just for clarity here, right? Uh, by the time we get out to 2032, 2033, Xi Jinping will be pushing 80, right? And so, uh, you know, this isn't something that's going to be able to wait forever and ever and ever if that indeed is a clock. Clock two might be kind of the PLA clock. The PLA is the People's Liberation Army, China's military. And it is now undertaking a set of reforms that um, among other things would make it far more capable of conducting a blockade of Taiwan, perhaps an amphibious assault on Taiwan, some sort of Taiwan operation. Some of those capabilities were advertised in the exercises and the show of force last August, but as best we know, 2027 is kind of the date at which this round of reforms is meant to be completed. And 2027 is the date that Xi Jinping has given the PLA for being ready for a Taiwan contingency. Again, not that he's ordered it, he's just said, be ready, right? And so that's clock number two. Clock number three um, might be kind of the Taiwanese political clock. And so, you know, Xi Jinping, who, who wants to get something by war if you can get it by peace? His preference is clearly to achieve unification with Taiwan through quasi-peaceful measures, coercion, for instance, than through outright aggression. 
The problem is that that looks less and less likely as time goes on. The Taiwanese population very much opposed to anything that looks like unification with China. They saw what happened in Hong Kong in 2018, 2019, and don't want any part of that. You get a stronger Taiwanese political identity that develops every year. And in the last two presidential elections, the party that is more friendly to China, the KMT, has gotten its clock cleaned by the party that is um, a bit more hawkish on security issues, which is the DPP. And so Taiwan has another presidential election coming up in 2024. Could very well be close, not quite clear who has the advantage. But if the DPP were to win again, then the message that Xi Jinping might take away is that the road to peaceful unification is closed, or at least it's narrowing, and so you have to explore alternative measures. And then the fourth clock is, let's call it kind of like the, the free world response clock. And so this is um, how much time do the United States, Taiwan, their friends and allies need to get ready to deter or defend against an attack on Taiwan in a more serious way. And the challenge here is that most of the defense modernization programs that are happening in these countries are optimized to yield fruit in the early 2030s, right? That's clearly the case with the US defense program um, I think it's the case with the Australian defense program. Japan is a little bit of an exception due to the fact that it's accelerating its buildup to be ready for kind of a late 2020s contingency. But actually between now and say the late 2020s, China's military power is going to go like this and U.S. naval power is going to go like this because we have to retire a bunch of ships and, and planes that were built during the 1980s. So this has been long and complicated, but I think it actually points you in a particular direction. And the direction it points you in is the late 2020s, as, as a time when Chinese military advantages will be, I think, as great as they will ever be uh, in the Western Pacific. It's a time when Xi Jinping may be getting jumpier about uh, whether Taiwan is sort of slipping away from him politically. It's a time when the U.S. and its allies won't quite be ready for a conflict. And it's a time when he's going to be increasingly legacy conscious uh, himself. And so if you had to pick a moment when the risk of something really bad happening, of a war breaking out, would be highest, that would be my guess, because that's kind of the sweet spot when you bring all of these clocks together. I have to say, listening to some recent talks by some military official, U.S. military officials, I've I've heard more of this talk about you know the next few years and also even the mid late twenty twenties, as uh, like you're talking about. I don't know how. I, I I hope a lot of high government officials are reading your stuff, Hal, and the, the, your your and your and Michael's stuff. I hope so. Uh, perhaps they have because I have heard some of these what sound like similar arguments from what's uh, from what has come out of your book. Uh, uh, being said, so it, it's a it's a very uh, precise summary for the for the potential for this and and sort of the longer term response from others and how the timing may not exactly work given uh, given these time frames. Uh, we have a question in the chat board from uh, Tara who's asked some before and I haven't gotten to them. I promise I will. Um, I do want to ask one follow up, then I'll get the Tara's question here. Uh, um, it's I don't think it's talked about enough, you know. The concern over Taiwan, obviously, and China potentially doing something with it. What's the potential for what's the potential for it not necessarily working out so well for China? Um, th this, I, you know, this is something that I don't think is discussed enough because it's just this assumption. Well, you know, China, I mean, China's this huge military, this huge power. Obviously, could go and you know do these things with Taiwan and take it, quote unquote. But well, I mean, what would that actually? Well, I shouldn't necessarily about what that would actually look like. But how 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 could it? How could it backfire on China in a way, or how could they be holding something that would not necessarily be amenable to being held? Yeah. Um, is is that is that something that maybe you could speak to a little bit, Hal? Because uh, I, I think that's again something that doesn't get a lot of play and, and and probably should. Sort of looking at this, like you know, we we we've seen before about how how powers try to expand and then they get a lot more than they bargain for. Uh, and on the negative side. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit, then we'll get the terrorist question after after this. It, it's a really important subject. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, you know, I've sort of given everybody the bad news. The good news is that if China does want to use force to try to make Taiwan submit, 
I think, and not everybody agrees with me on this, by the way, I, I think they would ultimately have to invade the island in order to do that. I don't think a blockade, for instance, would be sufficient to get Taiwan to give up its sovereignty. And an amphibious invasion of Taiwan would be one of the most complex, difficult military operations undertaken in human history. Um, this, this might be uh, an invasion that would rival the Normandy landings in terms of its size and complexity, it would require synchronizing operations between uh, the different services of the PLA in a way that China hasn't done particularly well in the past, although they're working very hard to get better at it. And and the terrain um, is just, the geography is just exceedingly difficult. I mean, you got to cross a big body, at least 100 miles uh, in most places, of water to get to Taiwan. There's only a handful of beaches you can land on that are suitable for amphibious uh, assaults. Uh, the terrain on Taiwan is very favorable for defense. You've got jungles, you've got mountains, you've got dense urban environments. And you've also got to deal with the prospect that it won't just be Taiwan. It'll be Taiwan plus the United States, plus maybe Japan, plus maybe some other countries. And so when you throw all that into the mix, there is a really significant chance that if China tried this, it would fail. And if it tried and failed, there's no guarantee that the CCP and that Xi Jinping in particular come out holding on to power on the other side. They might, but, but they can't be guaranteed uh, of it. Now, I don't want to sound Pollyannish. I'm, I'm pretty sure that if China attacks Taiwan, all of the scenarios at that point are awful from the perspective of the United States, both in terms of the military losses that would be involved in defeating that invasion, the damage it would do to the global economy, and 15 other things. So, so again, it's, it's worth keeping in mind that this would be bad for all sides. But I, it should be possible to make this inherently difficult undertaking look so challenging that even a more risk acceptant Xi Jinping is dissuaded from doing it because he worries that it might fail and that it might undermine his hold on power. And so to the extent that I'm hopeful about where we're going over the next decade, it's because of that issue that you raise. Well, and it's a, these analogies are obviously not in, in many ways the same, but I mean, th and to our audience to think about how many times in history, large quote unquote superpowers or those near that status have tried something with much smaller nations and those things have not always worked out as planned, right? Uh, you know, Russia and Afghanistan, the United States, Vietnam, I mean, we could go on a long, long list. Now, obviously China, Taiwan is a different, is certainly a different story. They're all different, obviously in numerous ways, but it is, it, it, it is something to think about, you know, about how um, we, we should not assume something as big as China, quote unquote, taking Taiwan in some way that that would just automatically work flow fine and then we're going to as as Hal has, has specified for us really well here so it is a, it is a good lesson for our students too in the big picture uh do we have time for maybe two or three more questions Hal? would that be fine that's a, okay um tara has a tara has a question here um can try in the in the chat board to me can china maintain its current economic growth this is about sort of china peaking um in the face of rising debt uh, potential financial crisis the demography issues too China growth has slowed, I mean, obviously within the past decade or so, but uh, is that something maybe uh, you, you could talk to a little bit as, as far as your peaking thesis, uh, Hal? Sure. So there's kind of three relevant levels of Chinese growth. The first was the explosive growth for three decades after 1978, 10, 12, 13% growth per year. That's gone and is never coming back, right? In part just because China's reach kind of the middle income level at which it becomes much, much harder to sustain those high levels of growth, and in part because of the factors that I talked about. The second level would be kind of the six, seven, eight percent that China achieved, at least according to its official statistics, uh, kind of from 2009 up until the beginning of COVID. I think that's gone two. I, I think sort of what we're looking at now is more like the growth statistics we've been seeing over the past couple of years, where you're looking at three, four, maybe five percent 
according to the official statistics. Now that that sounds great. You know, if America had five percent growth, we'd be over the moon about that. But what we have to remember it's a couple of things. One, China's just starting from a much lower position, and so it needs higher levels of growth to achieve the levels of prosperity that get it anywhere close to the United States. Two, nobody believes the statistics that the Chinese government puts out on on this. Um, and three, the form of growth that China has pursued and still pursues is extremely inefficient. It basically relies on the brute force injection of capital into the system. Um, and that has led to declining productivity and rising levels of debt, as, as you mentioned. And so if I had to guess, I'd say we're looking at a China, you know, that'll be between two, three, four, five percent growth in the coming years, much, much different than the China that we came to know over the previous few decades. And for our students too, you know, you oftentimes hear how China's GDP in absolute terms is bigger than the United States. I, I'm, am I'm amazed at how many high level officials will say this often, like it's that, like, you know, that this somehow makes China, you know, uh, equal status to us, if not more, when their median income, their average income, which would be at least as a social scientist, I would think a, a more accurate measure of where a nation is economically is substantially lower than the U.S. The average Chinese resident citizen is not at the same level of, of, of economic development as is the typical, the, the average median uh, U.S. citizen. So it is a it is a good point. They still have a ways to go, but you know, again, the, the factors are working uh, in some ways against them. Um, the um, China, you know, talking about China as, again, sort of expansionist and revisionist power, maybe we could sort of end on this sort of theme. Um, I think it's a good lesson for just the public and our students, too, about how, you know, regardless of what our relations are with any one country, including China, about how there can be a perspective, especially from a regime like China, which you know, I think accurately described as a, Len a Leninist style one party state, right? Uh, politically, how they can see themselves as resistant to this current global international liberal order. Um, how could you, uh, and I don't know, you know, maybe this goes beyond a little bit, uh, what, you know, what is the primary part of your book, but um, maybe talk, because I mean, that is obviously a core thing here, how China does see itself in some ways, historically and currently at least, in opposition to, um, as a as a Leninist one-party state, um, how, you know, a different type of system like that can result in a commitment to, you know, revising the current world order that, that we've had since, you know, basically the mid-20th century, and, you know, maybe why that is imp an important thing to to understand as well is 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 that is that an okay, okay yeah. question to take? Um, look I, I think that in many ways chinese behavior chinese revisionist behavior which you know just a fancy political science word for behavior that tries to change the way the international system works it's over determined right it comes from a bunch of different factors right and and one is the factor that realist scholars would point to which is that China's power has grown, and so its desire to make the international system reflect that power and reflect its preferences has, has grown. It's kind of the oldest story in history. There's no reason to think it wouldn't play out here. The second point, though, is the one that, that you reference, which is that ideology is an important driver of, of this. And so the fact that China is run by a deeply illiberal Leninist government means that it can never feel particularly comfortable in a liberal international order that's run by a liberal democratic superpower because the values that the united states espouses democracy human rights equal treatment before the law however imperfectly we apply them at home are mortal threats to a regime whose power is premised on the suppression of liberalism at home. And so Chinese leaders have, have always thought that the United States was trying to overthrow their system by promoting human rights, by encouraging China to reform economically and politically, and, and so on and so forth. That tension is built into the relationship between China's regime and the international regime. And then the, the third factor is history. There is a great book um, called Superpower Interrupted by a journalist named Michael Schumann. 
And the essential point is this. Uh, China has long seen itself as one of the greatest powers, if not the greatest power in the international system. For, for years, you know, for centuries, the Asian order revolved around China. At points, China was the strongest, most sophisticated country in the world. It's really only since the early 19th century that China was sort of demoted to the second or third tier of international politics when it became internally divided and was sort of carved up by foreign powers. And so the terminology that Chinese officials use is revealing. And, and so as much as Xi Jinping talks about the rise of China, he talks about the rejuvenation of China, that China is reclaiming the position it had before the century of humiliation, right? Before this long period, this hundred year period preceding the PRC, the, the creation of the PRC in 1949. And so from this perspective, the sort of behavior that China is engaging in, which aims to remake the international system, is simply a means of restoring China to its rightful place in the grand scheme of things. And so when you put these things together, they make a very powerful, a very potent cocktail, and they help us explain China's goals and China's behavior. It's not only the political ideology, it's also the history that goes and then the civilizational stuff that goes into that ideology and how you see explain that really well for us. So, so thank you a lot, a lot. There, there have been a lot of lessons here. Maybe we can end with one last question here. All of these lessons really good. Um, maybe put a capstone and summary on it. You know, why should Americans, why should we care about U.S. China relations and Taiwan? This probably relates in some ways to the last answer, but, uh, you know, the global liberal order and all that and the importance of that. But why, you know, I know that's kind of the fluffy last question or the, the general question, but why, why, sh why should we care about it? Is there a way to summarize uh, this in your mind, the importance of it and why it should be paramount uh, in, in the public's minds and uh, in our students' minds as well? Well, one reason we should care about it is that, you know, we've gotten used to living in a world where democracies are dominant, where, um, you know, great power war does not occur, where there is an open international economy that benefits us and benefits lots of other countries. And we've sort of forgotten what it looks like when all that collapses. And great power war is one of the things that can cause all that to collapse and and so if for no other reason we should really care about the u.s china relationship because whether we get this right is going to determine whether you know the coming century is an extension of this really remarkable 80 years of human history since the end of world war ii where the world has become more democratic more prosperous more secure than it ever was before that, or whether it's going to fall back into kind of the darker patterns of the, the past. So there are there are lots of reasons to be um, focused on this, lots of reasons to be concerned about it. But at a big picture level, I, I think that's the one that I think about the most. And so, you know, in the coming years, especially with China peaking, as is your thesis and Michael's thesis, we need to, you know, think about these things, have these things in our mind. It's a it's a very good lesson beyond all the specific lessons that you gave us here this evening, how to to chew on, to think about uh, deeply. And, uh, and I hope we all do here. So it's it's been a wide ranging uh, discussion, Hal. Uh, I, I personally really enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully we were able to get deep into your and Michael's book. Uh, some of the main findings. You've done a lot of good uh, documentary, historical, other sorts of research here in this. I encourage everybody to read it. Uh, if you've got some extra time, summer reading, pick it up. Uh, it's uh, it, it, it is it is quite a work. And uh, and again, I hope uh, has. Uh, do you get an international? I mean, well, obviously you do, but I mean, uh, do you do you have any sort sort of. Uh, ideas of a lot of people internationally are reading these bo these books. Obviously, there's an American audience for it. I didn't know if there's any. Uh, um, uh, yeah. maybe in the neighborhood too of China. I don't know. Do, yeah, do, I mean, we we've been, actually, we've been translated. Are, are, do you pick up American books like this, or I mean, like American uh, U.S. Yeah. China relations books like this. I mean, the book has been translated into Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. Um, so there seems to be a readership kind of along the Pacific rim there, um, and I think it's gotten some attention in in India and Europe and other places as as well. So um, you know, who who knows? But but at least people seem to be kind of looking at it and taking the argument seriously. All right, wonderful. Uh, well, Hal, uh, again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Again, you give us uh, uh, an incredible amount to think about here. 
and this will be a wonderful resource for us uh, this talk in the future. And uh, and uh, it was wonderful having you here. So again, thank you very much for uh, for coming this evening. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's it's been a real pleasure. All right, and everybody, thanks uh, for joining us on the Global Studies Lecture Series. We'll see you all uh, next time, probably this summer or next fall, uh, as we're ending the spring semester. So take care, everybody.